All right, uh, so today's our endocrine lecture. One of the more interesting uh, avenues you don't normally think about the endocrine system when you think about bioengineering, but uh, there are really remarkable opportunities both for modeling of the endocrine system, uh, mathematical modeling, uh, for designing treatments, for designing drug delivery, uh, and hopefully you'll get a, a flavor of that today. Uh, I also wanted to uh, play two of the movies that didn't work last time. We're, as you probably figured out this year, we've taken a big step forward in trying to make aspects of the course uh, not only online, but have more resources available uh, to you. That's created some fits and starts in the technology, including adaptation to this uh, particular system. But these are pretty cool movies, so I just wanted you to be able to see them. We figured out how to, how to get them running on this computer now. First one, if you remember from our musculoskeletal lecture, was the simulation-based treatment planning, and you have patients who have, for example, the crouch gait uh, walking, uh, and you can attach the, sense, the uh, uh, particular light sources that are picked up by the camera sensor and model their uh, multi-joint dynamics. And then you can boil that down to uh, muscle and tendon lengths, joint positions, and look at that in an uh, integrative uh, uh, fashion as this crouch gait uh, is, is, is operating. And you can see there are hypotheses. You know, the question is why, as simple as that issue is, why does this patient have a crouch gait? It's actually not completely clear. Which tendon is too short, which muscle is too tight, and, and in, in designing surgical interventions, you better have a, a pretty good idea of, of what's causing it. The other interesting uh, movie to show is this. It's an ACL tear as it's uh, happening. Watch. Those you can, they're, they're on the site now, so you can take a look at them. But again, there was, it was a, simply running, okay? There was not a, a pronounced lateral, uh, you know, insult of some kind. And, and so somehow we have to capture that. Is it due to uh, a stochastic event or is it due to accumulated micro tears and, and, uh, or due to creep of tendons and so on? And this is the sort of thing that uh, modeling uh, is probably going to be pretty necessary for. Yeah. Compensation, yeah. Yeah, it's a really neat idea. It might be how it starts or it might be part of how it starts anyway. Um, there's no question that in the end, in the mature state, the muscles and tendons do end up too short. And so, that, but, but that may be indeed part of how it starts is the, is the patient trying to compensate for poor balance. And, and if we can, that you know, points to early interventions that might be suitable. But yeah, thanks for that point. But again, it's not known. Again, we have a, a lot of uh, unknowns in this field. Uh, endocrine system, this is, uh, you know, we think about endocrine, you th people, many people think about uh, insulin, diabetes, uh, it's definitely related to milk and cookies, but not uh, entirely. And so we'll talk about uh, what is the endocrine system, physiology and anatomy, uh, talk about the disorders, some of the major ones, uh, most susceptible to intervention and modeling, and then we'll talk about uh, our hormone uh, replacement strategies. and. and how they might be uh, improved. Um, so the big idea with the endocrine system is it helps uh, in homeostasis over a range of different time scales. Um, and to do that, it needs to closely interact with the nervous system. The nervous system is assessing your environment, registering needs, opportunities, and it has to instruct the endocrine system on a number of things like how much energy do we need now? What sort of state do we need to be in? There are different complex behavioral states of high or low energy uh, that operate on very short time scales, fight or flight responses. And then there are longer time scale ones. Are we in a state of needing chronic high energy for the next few months? You know, that can be important too. But then of course there's also feedback from the endocrine system onto the nervous system. A lot of those adaptations, for example, do we need to be in an energy conservation state? Well, that's going to affect how the nervous system op operates. That might need to feed back and control behavioral uh, uh, adjustments to the situation. And so a, a very commonly uh, considered paradigm for how this works is uh, the state of glucose regulation in the blood. Now, uh, 
this is a multi-organ regulation. Uh, there is uh, something that happens with every meal that you have more glucose uh, that is available. The pancreas then registers that. It can detect uh, the incoming uh, nature of the food. It has a, a very rich uh, a system to detect elevated glucose uh, uh, in the GI tract uh, as well as in the bloodstream. And it secretes uh, insulin, a hormone which both acts on body tissues in general and on a specific uh, professional glucose regulator organ, the liver. And uh, insulin acts on those tissues to increase glucose uptake from the uh, blood. That decreases glucose and heads you back into the uh, correct uh, direction. Now, there might be an overshoot or there might be uh, a fasting situation where blood glucose is dropping. That's also detected by the pancreas. Uh, there's a separate hormone uh, called glucagon, which is then involved in triggering particularly the liver to release glucose and to carry out the metabolic steps that are needed to liberate glucose from a, a polymer in which it's commonly stored in the form of uh, glycogen. And that elevates uh, glucose back to homeostatic uh, levels. Blood glucose is pretty tightly regulated. Um, it's pretty important that it be tightly regulated. If it uh, gets too high, you get osmotic problems in the blood. It's uh, osmol, and it can create ion and water shifts that can be life-threatening. Uh, if, if it gets too low, the tissues don't have the energy they need. You can slip into somnolent uh, coma, seizure, and death. Now, that's an example. What is the endocrine system? Well, it's a million different things, little clusters of cells scattered all around the body. Some of them are not even as clustered as you'd like. Uh, there's uh, some real mysteries. So, for example, the thyroid gland has studded on it uh, multiple parathyroid glands that are separate, okay? And really, the thyroid and the parathyroid have essentially completely unrelated functions, and yet you have this parathyroid tissue embedded into the thyroid tissue. That creates big problems if you've got to take out the thyroid. If you've got a thyroid cancer, you've got this parathyroid tissue. Uh, Likewise, the adrenal glands, which sit on top of the kidneys, do many different things, uh, regulating uh, stress hormones, salt balance, and sex hormones. A single problem can cause completely uh, uh, different multifarious uh, uh, sets of symptoms. Uh, but they act via the bloodstream. They can be anywhere as long as they have access to the blood and they secrete their signaling molecule into the blood. And they, of course, get information from elsewhere. Uh, there is, at least to some extent, there is a, a gland which regulates the other glands, the pituitary uh, gland. That is in the brain and is under very tight control from the hypothalamus, uh, which is uh, no part of the neurons, and there's a direct neuronal glandular link between the hypothalamus. Uh, but all these other organs are, to one extent or another, under control of the, of the pituitary. How does that work? Well, they, even the pituitary has different parts. It's got an anterior and a posterior part. Uh, and completely different functions are subserved by the anterior and posterior part. The posterior part is a little simpler. Um, uh, but uh, in reality, they're both complex. And the other challenging thing is the different cell types are completely intermixed. And so again, if you've got a cancer, as sometimes happens in the pituitary, and you've got to take it out, depending on which part you take out, you've got to do supplementation uh, of hormones for corresponding to the parts that are, are lost. Um, and a, a very common theme is that um, it's single hormone can have multiple effects. Uh, oxytocin both helps regulate uh, uh, lactation, uh, but also uterine contractions. Um, and other hormones uh, are simpler, but then you can have a situation where multiple separate hormones can act on a, a, a single given target. And for example, uh, the kidneys under control of uh, vasopressin or antidiuretic hormone, this keeps Water in antidiuretic <clears throat> helps reduce the loss <clears throat> of, of fluid from the body. But the uh, 
kidney is also uh, regulated by, among other hormones, aldosterone, which is coming from the adrenal, which in turn gets its control <coughs> from a hormone from the pituitary, and that regulates salt balance, which in turn affects water balance. We'll get back to kidney function in a later lecture. The point here is that each organ has multiple separate competing uh, hormones that are affecting it. Now, uh, is there a big picture logic to it all? Could you model the entire endocrine system in some way, given all the feedback? Is it, is it, is it like a, a neural network in some way? If we knew what to measure, uh, uh, and if we knew which kinetic properties and which feedback properties were operative, we could indeed model it. And there are steps along the way toward that. Starting with a simple hormone, you can model insulin concentration, the rate of change of insulin concentration as a function. You've got uh, absorptive uh, processes, you've got elimination processes, there's a first order rate constant of insulin elimination to a, a first order approximation uh, via the kidney. And so you can model this. This becomes particularly important in thinking about insulin dosing in diabetes. There's a whole range of different insulin preparations that have different kinetics of uh, clearance and being able to model that. It's not a, <clears throat> a very simple uh, uh, set of equations. But actually, there's a, a neat site you can go and play around with. It's for educational purposes, but you can, it's a freeware program that you can uh, use to predict insulin treatment for insulin-dependent diabetes. It's, it's educational only, but uh, uh, analogous things are used to help uh, in the design of the different uh, long-acting versus short-acting uh, insulin preparations. And, the problem is, though, the models are still not good enough. You've always got to build in direct measurement of glucose level in the blood, which involves, in most cases, still uh, a finger stick. And so um, models are cool, but not predictive enough. And you've got all these different, one of the reasons that it's, they're not predictive enough is there's incredible complexity to uh, what happens to, to glucose and insulin. Both insulin and glucose are taken up and excreted or, or cleared by different uh, uh, organs, and this can change over time. Um, uh, and it's a very non-stationary process. This particular program, there's 16 separate equations that are solved by your machine. You don't have to play around with it, but feel free to look at it if you're so that's the status. Even one hormone, incredibly complex. We don't have all the uh, information accurately uh, predicted. Okay, so disease states, these are pretty instructive. Uh, you know, the key thing is balance. There's no good or bad hormone. It's all about homeostasis. It's all about balance. You can have hormone excess or hormone deficiency. Uh, typically, if you have hormone excess, too high of a hormone, well, typically there's been a failure of a feedback control, because all these are under constant feedback control. Uh, so a failure of inactivation. It could also be due to a failure of excretion. Uh, different hormones are cleared by different mechanisms. Or there could be a tumor. Some endocrine tissues, when they become cancerous, over-secrete. Not all. Some fail to secrete, but some over-secrete, and that uh, can be a so typically, uh, you can come in with surgery or radiation. You can try to destroy the, the, the tumor. But again, like the thyroid example, that's not always what you want. You're going to take out another completely unrelated endocrine tissue as well. Uh, and trying to design better medicines um, is, is very relevant. By the way, on your case study, your day three case study, you guys all basically uh, did, did a great job and got to one of the key points in terms of, of both diagnosis and treatment, but with, with treatment, you know, almost all the groups said, hey, why don't we come up with a better, more specific anti-NMJ receptor uh, a targeting strategy, which is great. That would, you know, be obviously ideal and preferable to pumping in huge quantities of uh, IVIG from thousands of patients. Um, very similar principle here. How could we design a, a very specific prevention to that uh, hormone, maybe an antibody? maybe a designer uh, medication of some kind. Now, you can get deficiencies as well. Could start from the beginning, genetic defect. You can't make the, the hormone tissue loss or death, tumors also, or dietary deficiency. Uh, iodine, for example, required for thyroid hormone uh, production. 
And in many cases, you can simply supplement. Uh, this can get pretty complicated if it's a pituitary tumor that you take it out. These are patients who are on enormous cocktails of five, six, seven, or up to a dozen different hormones and, and <clears throat> compensatory strategies. Um, but if it's pretty simple, just loss of thyroid tissue, you can just replace with oral uh, thyroid hormone. Yeah, great question. The question is timing of hormone treatments, uh, delivery. Presumably that's going to be unrelated to when the body normally delivers a pulse or, or needs it. And that is true. Uh, and there are different ways to compensate for that. And so insulin is a great example. Obviously, you need a pulse of insulin when you have a meal, but not other times. And so there are long-acting preparations that dole out the insulin very slowly over time. Uh, so at least you don't get a huge pulse of insulin and therefore a huge pulse of glucose extraction when you least need it. Could be, could be worse. Uh, other hormones don't have this incredibly fine temporal requirement. Uh, so thyroid hormone, you can take one pill a day and it kind of maintains a, a, a level that seems to address most of the symptoms of site requirement. And then there's an intermediate ground, like some growth hormones, they, they do have to come in pulses at particular times of day. And in that case, we do try to make the patient take the medication at the right time. Yeah. Yeah. Great question, too. But question is bodily compensation. Does your body compensate or overcompensate or problematically compensate for this chronic treatment? And that, if you don't deliver something in a pulsatile fashion, you can get receptor downregulation, for example, a high steady concentration of a hormone in a way the body's not used to experiencing it can indeed cause adaptive changes, which are kind of okay as long as you're able to keep providing the, the hormone, but then discontinuation becomes a problem, and then you've got a situation where the body's got Downregulated receptors and, and um, look like they're in a deficient state, even if they're not. So uh, that that can happen. Um, surprisingly, um, less of an issue with uh, some of the more common endocrine treatments. It hasn't been a big problem with with uh, insulin, with thyroid hormone, with growth hormone. But uh, it's definitely something you have to be alert for. Um, and then there is this other category. You can have exactly the right amount of hormone, but the tissue, the downstream tissue, is not responding to it correctly. And this includes some kinds of diabetes, for example, which can become uh, Again, you can have a failure in the receptor. You can have autoimmune issues, target tissue, sensitized uh, receptors. Uh, this can be harder to treat. Um, you know, if the receptor pathway is not there, how do you treat it? And sometimes. You can overcome it with more uh, drugs, higher concentrations, uh, but sometimes you can't, and that's one thing that makes resistant <laughs> diabetes kind of hard to treat. So let's start with some you know, concrete examples to, to illustrate this. So parathyroid, little things studded in the, in the thyroid, their job is to regulate um, uh, a steroid-like hormone it's uh, vitamin D derived. And it's a, ultimately, it's about calcium and phosphate, chiefly homeostasis, keeping those at the right level. So they interact with uh, sun, skin, and bone in the following complex way. So first of all, you need uh, sunlight to create the hormone. A precursor to the hormone actually is generated only in skin and only through sunlight all kinds of deficiencies that can happen. Uh, parathyroid hormone uh, it determines if the active form uh, of this regulator, uh, calcitriol, is, is uh, active. Now, uh, different downstream tissues regulate calcium and phosphate. The kidney uh, plays a key role in production of calcitriol, but it ultimately comes down to bone. Bone is where most of the calcium and phosphate are stored. Uh, there's also somewhat of a role in the liver and 
intestine in terms of whether to take up or not calcium and phosphate from uh, the food uh, content. But the bone and the uh, osteoblasts and osteoclasts are extremely important in responding to the uh, If this fails, if you have deficiency, uh, you get rickets uh, initially and adequate sunlight, poor diet, liver or kidney disease or receptor defects can cause this. The bones become uh, weak, painful, uh, bent, impaired growth. The correction is to uh, simply supplement with, with vitamins. Um, vitamin D is fat soluble. A, D, E, and K are all fat soluble, uh, which means they can uh, actually build up to toxic levels. Uh, there is a risk of overdosing with vitamin D, but in general, it's uh, pretty safe and simple. What about thyroid? So th thyroid uh, has these very global effects. It's like a, one way to think about thyroid is it's a long-term version of the fight or flight response. You think about sympathetic, parasympathetic, those switch you from kind of a uh, energy conserving, resting, digesting mode into an active uh, fighting, running, uh, energy burning state. That operates over a very fast time scale. Minutes. Uh, the thyroid is, sort of implements a longer time scale version of this and um, if you have high thyroid hormone it tends to put you into the high energy state. Low puts you into the low. And what are the symptoms of, of this? Well it kind of looks, if, if it's too low, hypothyroidism, too low, it looks like a slower metabolism that's inappropriate for the situation. So you have it's almost like you're entering into a hibernation-like state. You have fatigue, uh, weakness, heat gain, cold intolerance, uh, uh, sense of, uh, uh, you know, the skin becomes cold. Uh, it's you know, devoting very little energy to maintaining an elevated body temperature, particularly in this person. And there can be a depression, too. You can get into a, 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 a psychiatric uh, state. Um, it's caused. You know, there are common causes. Um, you can have a thyroid hormone deficiency, uh, which is coming from the thyroid, and that can be due to an autoimmune issue. There's uh, different kinds of thyroiditis, inflammation of the thyroid, Hashimoto's being a pretty common one. Um, you can also get a medical intervention that destroys too much of the thyroid. Uh, different kinds of surgeries in the neck uh, can contribute. Um, and here a useful distinction is between primary hypothyroidism and secondary. So primary means it's the root cause that the thyroid can't produce the amount of hormones that are being called for. The thyroid, like many of the other glands, is under control of the pituitary and there's something called thyroid stimulating hormone or TSH which comes from the pituitary, goes through the blood, finds the thyroid and drives it to produce more thyroid hormone. But you can also have a perfectly fine thyroid and still be hypothyroid. And that's called secondary. Thyroid's only a secondary problem. The problem is the pituitary isn't secreting TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone, and that could happen due to a central nervous system primary problem. Um, and so a whole host of different possible causes. Uh, people who are hypothyroid tend to look kind of droopy, gain weight, uh, low energy, um, are cases which are kind of uh, uh, amusing, but also a little funny. So, this radiation therapy is a is a very common cause. All kinds of head and neck cancers uh, get treated with radiation. Uh, usually, surgery, chemo, and radiation. That triad is is uh, quite common. And because the replacement is pretty straightforward, you know, it's you can simply eat. The thyroid hormone, um, and it's a pill you have to take, and it, that works. So people are less concerned typically about destroying the thyroid gland in, in the course of surgeries. Obviously, you'd like to avoid it if possible, but it's not the end of the world. And so uh, people tend uh, uh, to see it as a allowable collateral damage. But in reality, um, you know, 
that means someone's on a lifelong medication that's expensive. If they fail to take it right uh, and slip into a hypothyroid state, that can contribute to <laughs> serious medical problems, including depression and suicide. So it's not as minor as you might think. So, you know, improved strategies, imaging strategies to more precisely define exactly where the thyroid is. Uh, and by the way, a lot of you in your case study uh, were right to think about improved imaging strategies to identify the locations of, of, of tumors and the uh, uh, kinds of inflammation going on in the brain. Likewise, precise delineation of the thyroid and, and computer-guided uh, treatment strategies is going to be very important for reducing uh, the symptoms. Uh, yes, that's exactly right. So. And there's another problem, which I didn't uh, state yet. The, you can eat the thyroid hormone. It's, it's uh, basically, it's something that gets absorbed. It doesn't get chopped up by proteases in the stomach. Unfortunately, thyroid stimulating hormone is a, a polypeptide, and you can't simply uh, consume that. So right away, it's harder to treat that. Uh, and second, secondly, there's usually a constellation of problems that are associated with the secondary, and so it's, it's often primary is pretty straightforward to treat. Now the flip side is uh, hyperthyroidism, too much. Um, major cause is also autoimmune, in this case, grave disease. Um, in case you get autoantibodies, kind of like the anti-NMD receptor antibodies, which uh, drove, drove it and caused seizures and the other problems that the, the in this case, the antibodies uh, are actually stimulating, they actually act on the PSH receptor and drive it, drive the thyroid to produce uh, thyroid hormone even when it's not needed. And that accounts to a large majority of cases. Um, you get this uh, protruding eye symptom. It's, it's not really that you're hyper alert actually, although it kind of looks like that and they are hyper alert, but there's actually a, a fat pad behind the eyes that gets uh, uh, inflamed and it causes protrusion of the um, that's one symptom that is not uncommon. You also get this sort of constellation of increased metabolic activity. You get tremulous, uh, uh, heat intolerant. Uh, you've got an elevated body temperature often. There's increased sweating. There's weight loss, increased appetite, uh, tachycardia, high heart rate. Um, this, uh, yeah. There mood. Yeah, it does. Re it, there is a, a pronounced thermoregulatory effect of, of uh, thyroid hormone. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, so how would you treat it? Well, um, you, know, you you go in and you target the thyroid typically, and a common treatment is radioiodine. So iodine is used for only one thing in the body, and that's to make thyroid hormone. And so basically, the the only organ that takes up iodine is thyroid. And so that's a great trick to use in principle. You can make a radioactive iodine and it's going to go to only one place and get incredibly concentrated there. And so it could, in theory, be used to target the tumor and it actually does and it's still uh, the most common treatment. You can avoid surgery in that case, avoid all the potential complications. Um, and interesting, it also can be used for diagnosis. I'll show you an image of that in a second, but you can actually, because it's the only place that takes up the radioactive iodine, you can then image the thyroid uh, using nuclear medicine uh, imaging strategies. So I-131 is, is pretty commonly used. Um, gives off uh, gamma and beta particles. And you can actually image, have a sort of a scan that, that's carried out. You can have a photomultiplier tube uh, that detects photons uh, that are by a gamma rays uh, crystal. And you can end up with these kind of low resolution. This is a thyroid gland, so you've got sort of centimeter scale uh, uh, features. You can even see this little uh, dip in the two lobes of the thyroid, so it's got that sort of level of resolution. And Graves disease, you've got this hyperproduction, and so you've got increased uh, uptake, and so you can actually see uh, the thyroid look bigger by this measure. So it works. You, basically, the patient just eats uh, radioactive iodine and 
uh, because it doesn't go anywhere else in the body, it actually is safe. It, it causes uh, you know, extremely low incidences of other uh, problems. Um, it's diagnostic and also, if you keep it up, uh, therapeutic. Um, but, you know, you still have to be careful. Uh, you don't treat a pregnant. Uh, you stay, you know, away from other people uh, when you're having the uh, diagnostic uh, test done. You got to be careful with uh, treated fluids and, and so on. Okay, so that's thyroid. Um, adrenal, this is a pretty complex one. Uh, it gets into this sort of multi dimensional feature of even a single endocrine tissue. Okay, the adrenal glands, these are the little things sitting on the, the kidneys. Um, if you have an excess of adrenal function, you get a, a complex syndrome uh, called Cushing's. Um, one of the dominant hormones secreted by the adrenal gland are glucocorticoids. These are also steroid hormones. They look like cholesterol, estrogen, testosterone, uh, just with some different side groups. Uh, and sometimes they're given to people. Sometimes you'll give people uh, corticoids. They're used uh, to reduce inflammation of various kinds. Uh, so you'll have people who are, have rheumatoid arthritis, asthma, and so on, taking these. Um, but you also can get tumors that uh, affect the uh, pituitary. There are adrenal stimulating hormones that come pituitary as well. And if those get over secreted, or if you have a, a adrenal tumor itself, you can get too much. Okay, so what do you get? Well, it doesn't fall into a sort of a clear picture in the way thyroid does. Uh, glucocorticoids just do many different things, sometimes uh, uh, forming a very complex picture. But one striking visual thing is a change in fat distribution. So you get a, a deposition of fat, particularly in the upper back, called a buffalo hump. You also get a truncal obesity as well. The skin becomes sort of vulnerable and frail. Uh, you get easy bruising. You get these stripe-like patterns called stria or stretch marks. Yeah. They do a lot of different things. And, and so it's, it's hard to capture even in a single uh, uh, lecture. So they regulate uh, uh, sugar levels. They regulate uh, protein translation levels uh, up and down. Um, they, uh, they regulate uh, indirectly the sex hormones. Um, so it's, it's actually an extremely complex picture. It's, it's harder to say fluid corticoids do X. If you do say it, uh, sometimes people will say they're a stress-related hormone. Um, but I tend to steer away from that because it doesn't even fall into that picture extremely cleanly. So in a way, it's an example of a multifactorial. It's almost like a, a neuron in a neural network that plays multiple roles in mul multiple different memories. And, yeah, it's crucial for all of them, but it, it, it does many different things. Um, uh, it regulates uh, sugars, and so you actually can you know, have a big spike in serum glucose after you take uh, 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 these corticoids, um, and so you end up getting dysregulated uh, sugar. You can also get mental problems. People can become uh, psychotic with uh, too high glucose. Um, so uh, what, what do you do for treatment? Well, you, if there's a surgical option for the root cause, again, if there's a pituitary cause, uh, you go for that uh, in some cases. Uh, there are uh, uh, medication strategies, but in reality, this is, uh, you know, those by the same token have many side effects as well, so it's a little harder to regulate uh, medically. So typically surgery or radiation aimed at whatever the cause of the hyperproduction is. Flip side, little action of the adrenal glands is something called Addison's disease. JFK suffered from that. Uh, was not widely known. Um, and this is usually it's an autoimmune attack on the adrenal gland. Um, and you get again a range of seemingly unrelated symptoms because of the complexity of the gland. Uh, you have changes in carbohydrate metabolism, sugar dysregulation. 
One thing the adrenal does, uh, it secretes aldosterone, which we mentioned before, that regulates salt balance in the kidneys, and so you can have dysregulated blood pressure, uh, regulated volume uh, of the uh, content of the, the vascular. Uh, you can get sh shifts in uh, the pH balance of the blood as well. Hair loss as well. There's a uh, glands are also involved in androgen testosterone uh, uh, regulation, and so you can get uh, uh, sort of a hyper uh, uh, testosterone related phenotype. I think you can uh, uh, go for piecemeal hormone replacement uh, of the relevant uh, hormones. Growth hormone this is an important one. It's actually increasingly becoming amenable to treatment. Uh, this one comes directly from the central nervous system, secreted by uh, the pituitary. In turn, regulated by the hypothalamus, so you can get an abnormality in either the pituitary or the hypothalamus. Often congenital from birth, or can be acquired your head injury or central nervous system tumor. How do you pick it up? Well, it's it's a you know it's the kind of thing that you don't really notice until there's already a hard to fix problem. Um, so when kids grow at a normal rate for a while and then fall off the growth curve, that's how you pick it up. So that's why the pediatricians uh, uh, pay such close attention to not only where you are in the growth curve but but your past trajectory to see if something's uh, dropping off. But it doesn't necessarily mean growth hormone deficiency. That could just be that person's idiosyncratic pattern of growth, or there could be uh, their problems, nutritional uh, disease. Um, so what do you do if you suspect it? So you've got a kid, they're, they're no longer keeping up with their past uh, trajectory. Well. Go measure growth hormone, you might think, um, but growth hormone is one of those that comes in a pulsatile fashion. Uh, it's hard to come in and time it at the right level, uh, and so it's not always easy uh, to nail down the, the fact of a growth hormone deficiency. But uh, it does work, uh, particularly in clear cases. X rays also uh, help um, in uh, diagnosis of the possibility of growth hormone replacement therapy. So, um, there's a particular step. Uh, called a bone fusion that happens. We have more bones when we're born than we end up with because there's this process of uh, growth and meeting of bones and ultimate fusion of them. Uh, once they fuse, they can't grow more at that uh, interface. And so it's no longer possible to increase the length of the limb at that interface. And so growth hormone replacement therapy is useful pre bone fusion, but not post bone fusion. And so Successful therapy for growth hormone. Diabetes, this is the big one. 6.3% um, of the U.S. population in 2002. I uh, haven't seen the numbers from the latest census, but they're probably bigger. Uh, sixth leading cause of death in the U.S. at that point. Um, and it is really many different diseases all in one. Um, the uh, basic problem is blood sugar regulation. That's what diabetes is, but it can be caused by multiple different uh, original problems, and those fall into two broad categories, type 1 and type 2. Type 1 is juvenile onset or insulin dependent. Typically, it's autoimmune against the pancreatic beta cells that are releasing the insulin. And so you've got a person who can't make insulin, so what happens then? Well. Blood sugar gets high. Blood sugar gets high. What happens? What do you think? What's going to happen as your blood sugar gets high? That stay high, but that's fine. You got a lot of sugar around, right? So you're good to go. Yeah. So osmolarity. That's when it gets very extreme. So normal blood osmolarity is about 300 milliosmoles. Patients who get into diabetic hyperosmolar trouble can, leave, can have coma and death, coma, seizure, and death. That, they can even get up to 900 milliosmoles. 
So what's that going to do? That's going to suck all the water out of the interstitial space, out of the cells. Uh, other issues, what else is going to be a problem with too much uh, sugar around? You get kidney damage, you get a lot of end organ damage. Typically end organs like the kidney that have extremely fine and important working blood vessels. Okay, and why does that happen? This is not at all obvious uh, why this would happen. But very high sugar over time will lead to increased uh, glycosylation, sticking on of sugars of, onto proteins. You get buildup of uh, not only the glycosylated proteins, but that will trigger in turn growth of uh, the endothelial cells and the fibroblasts that are in and around the blood vessels. End result of all that is you get narrowing of blood vessels. Uh, so blood doesn't get to end organs uh, efficiently. This is a chronic thing that happens over time. Uh, that means tissue becomes ischemic. It's not getting enough blood. It's not getting enough oxygen, not getting enough tissue. Blood immune cells can't get to the end organs as well, which means you're susceptible to infection. Uh, nerves aren't getting enough blood supply, so they start to, you get tingling, paresthesias, they start to be dysfunctional, causing pain or not allowing you to sense pain also. And people, you know, as you're constantly shifting your position unconsciously due to receptors telling you it's time to shift, give that part of the skin a break. Diabetics don't have that, and so they have uh, pressure ulcers, uh, that skin breakdown, cause infection, death, and, and that's a, so many, many things can happen. Uh, not obvious things that can happen as a result of chronic high elevated. But, you know, we can make insulin now. We know what the issue is. We can make it in recombinant fashion, deliver it. Of course, the whole issue of the feedback control remains, but it's, uh, it works. This one's harder. On insulin dependent or adult onset, uh, plenty of insulin around, but the target tissues are not sensitive to it. They're not responding. In, in Way. Uh, are the receptors less sensitive? Why are they less sensitive? Completely unclear. Uh, it does seem as though uh, diet, overall weight, and exercise levels all play a role. Uh, sedentary lifestyles, overweight, low exercise, uh, diet in terms of lipids and sugar intake uh, clearly increases susceptibility. Um, and that's also the so uh, what are the symptoms? Well, high blood glucose, you can detect it early on. Because you have so much glucose, uh, that also creates osmotic pressure on the kidneys. You get urine, and that also then increases thirst, polydipsia. Uh, lose glucose through urine. Uh, that, of course, increases the metabolic need. Uh, and you have issues that you can run into, like fatigue, uh, weight loss, and weight gain. Of those particularly life threatening, you get into the real life threatening issues that we mentioned damage to the end organs. So now uh, we'll go to hormone uh, replacement therapy and talk about some of the devices, uh, strategies for building open loop or closed loop replacements. So there are some general classes of hormone replacement. There's what you might call the slow, continuous open loop. What's done with thyroid, for example? You identify that the patient is hypothyroid. You just say, "Here's a pill. Take it once a day for a month. Come back and see me in a month." And there's no closed loop assessment except that month later doctor visit. Um, and that works if it's a if it's a long acting problem where you don't get into really serious trouble if you have too much or too little. Um, the growth, uh, particularly sexual related growth and reproduction, those, while not life threatening, if you get a little bit out of whack, uh, <coughs> they tend to require pulsatile uh, delivery. Their receptors can desensitize, and they really have to be delivered in a pulsatile fashion. Um, and in this case, uh, to make sure that you get this pulse, you know, oral consumption of a hormone will tend not to give you uh, a very high pulse. There will be kinetics of absorption, entry into the bloodstream, low clearance, uh, direct infusion, into the vasculature is necessary. For
Um, then you've got the cases where not only does it have to be rapid, but if you screw up, you're in serious trouble. And that's uh, the challenge that we have with diabetes. Good. So right now, growth hormone, you know, we can harvest this. Uh, you can take it from pituitary glands. It's a peptide, so you can't consume it orally. You can simply digest it. That would be the end of the story. You still have to inject it right now. Of course, that's not popular. People don't like injecting themselves or getting injected. So different strategies. Could you have a longer acting version, something that would be in some sort of depot or slow release preparation, so at least cut down on the number of injections, but the problem is you've got to have this uh, pulsatile uh, delivery for, for optimal function. And so that's been the challenge so far. It's still uh, largely injection-based. Mentioned a couple of times the sort of slow release possibility. How is that done? Here's where chemical engineering meets bioengineering. It's, it's some of the most, uh, you know, important innovations that have come uh, in drug delivery have been And what you do in some cases, basically you attach polyethylene glycol, PEG, called pegylation. Um, what does this do? Well, first of all, it's safe. You know, it doesn't cause an immune response. You can simply attach this polymer or a methylated polymer or a branched version to a particular uh, compound of interest, like a drug. And what does that do? Well, we'll hear more about this in kidney, but if you just make something bigger, that reduces its clearance uh, from the kidney, so that can make something last longer, slower off rate of, of clearance. Uh, also helping that uh, errors enzyme degradation. Enzymes are not naturally designed to target polyethylene glycol, and so they don't do it. Um, and, you know, a little surprisingly, it actually seems to reduce the immunological uh, consequences uh, probably prevents the immune system again from interacting with the, the foreign compound and increase stability as well over pH and temperature changes. You have to, you know, be careful with your chemistry. Make sure you're not affecting the dissociation constant. And uh, basically, longer and the more branched it is, you can um, both get into more problems, but also increase the uh, now. There are more complex versions of this sort of a depot uh, preparation. Um, psychiatry, we love depot preparations for chronic schizophrenics uh, or who are not always the ones you can rely on to take medications every day. And so there are preparations like a depot uh, a Risperdal or Risperidone, which can be an injection that you give once every two weeks. And the principle there is you have the medication um, that's embedded in a uh, polymer that's biodegradable. You can do it with a small organic. You can also do it with a, a peptide like growth hormone. Uh, and it's a matrix. Uh, for example, a PLG, polydial lactide coglycolide, a biodegradable polymer. Um, so here you rely on the, uh, the slow degradation. Uh, you get one or two times a month. And you know, growth hormone, this, this was uh, an initial version that Genentech uh, generated that uh, gave rise to uh, less effective. And if you have this sort of pulsatile delivery, but at least it cut down on the number of injections needed. Completely gone. There are other kinds of uh, modifications. You can tack on uh, polypeptides uh, instead of uh, organic polymers. X10 is a, is a genetic fusion of a, a polypeptide. Uh, that gives rise to a pretty long-term stability in plasma concentration over uh, hours. Uh, depends on the length of the tail, um, and you can dominant fashion in the lab. Um, and animal studies look uh, pretty good, and uh, that's one potential strategy for human use. So a big avenue for chemical engineers, chemical engineering-minded bioengineers. big impacts on, on human health. So that's sort of the slow, continuous open loop. Uh, right now, you know, as we mentioned a couple times, uh, to optimally get effects, you might want more pulsatile delivery. Here's what I've mentioned a couple times in this pulsatile fashion of uh, 
how the body normally regulates the growth hormone. And there are particular peaks that happen. It's pretty interesting. Why exactly this happens, we don't know, but we know the body uh, depends on it. Uh, that uh, if you don't do this, you get less of a uh, effect of the, of the growth. Um, so there are uh, uh, peaks and troughs of growth hormone that come at characteristic uh, times. Uh, often there's a, a maximum during sleep periods. Smaller peaks around uh, lunchtime, supper. Um, and so that, you know, presumably we'd like to mimic that if we could. So how could you do that in a non-depot way, right? Because that's going to be slow. How could you do that uh, faster for polypeptide? Well, there are skin-related strategies, transdermal delivery, uh, and different ways of forming. Uh, you know, you're still going in through the skin, but not, in this case, with a big needle. So I'll tell you about a few different strategies to, to gain access without a large needle. In some cases, you can form uh, uh, microchannels in the skin. And there's a few ways you can do it mechanically or by radio frequency. Um, and if, kind of like a skin dermabrasion, you can actually do a very focal uh, uh, radio frequency ablation of the skin, forming microchannels, and then you apply this uh, bioderm patch, dry form of, of human growth hormone to skin, leave it on for 24 hours. And you know that that gives you kind of a pulsatile delivery. You get this uh, peak when you put on the the patch, and it drops. So that, in theory, is an improvement. You can also this is another active area of research. You get good bioavailability in rats as well with this one. Uh, Micro needles here. The patch. There's not radio frequency ablation of the skin, but it's a patch with uh, uh, engineered micro needles that are filled with growth hormone. Relatively painless. You just on the skin as well, um, long shelf life. Uh, cause a little bit of uh, reddening of the skin or erythema, a little irritation. Uh, and the skin, you know, that's an important barrier. It keeps out infectious agents. And in uh, theory, there's a, a risk of, uh, of modest infection. Um, you know, you've got about a two day period where you're. So you could get around that. You could implant a, a chip of some kind. Um, and this also looks pretty good uh, in, in vitro that uh, and it could be you know, electronically regulated to give you a particular temporal patterns. So the whole thing would be under the skin. Uh, and you would have, you know, how would you, uh, you know, store it? Well, you'd have reservoirs loaded with chemical. Uh, it all could be biodegradable, so the whole reservoir could be uh, biodegradable with the polymers we've talked about. Um, and in theory, you could have, for example, different membranes, uh, different thicknesses. And so those would rupture at different times, and you'd get pulses. Um, without an electronic control, you might not get the time of day, right? But at least you'd get uh, stochastic uh, pulses instead of stable uh, eddy levels, which would be pretty good in addressing this receptor desensitization issue. Um, so, but a, a big opportunity, you can imagine a lot of things you could do to make that better. And then we get to rapid closed loop where you need to know what's going on before you give the next bit of, of hormone. Glucose is, is. So right now, you know, standard monitoring, you need at least four blood tests a day. And people with diabetes are pretty well trained. They're educated in, you know, the, uh, the different uh, doses they need to give depending on the blood sugar signal they see, what they've eaten. Many times they'll have at their disposal different uh, kinetics of, of insulin, slow release and fast. But this is the hard part here is compliance. Uh, really understandable. This is you know more than a thousand finger sticks in a year. Uh, Different populations of patients keep up with that to different levels. Kids and teenagers tend to be resistant. Veterans tend to be resistant. Uh, uh, but in general, you know, this is not a, a small issue. Even if you don't have uh, one of these immediate life-threatening things, very chronic issues operating over years, if your blood sugars tend to run a little high for 10, 20 years, kind of doing a good job, but not great. 
Well, that's still bad on the long-term time scale. Then you're, then you're getting this blood vessel damage, you're getting predisposition to all, all these constellations of end organ damage due to poor blood supply, uh, predisposing to heart attacks, a stroke, chronic damage to the peripheral nerves, um, pressure ulcers that can lead to infection, this is why people lose limbs with diabetes. Uh, yeah. The, uh, that's a great question. The question is, could you rely on urine glucose? Um, one challenge with that is it, it doesn't really tell you what the blood glucose is because it's, it's kind of a downstream post-homeostatic regulation effect. So the urine glucose could be high, but that could mean it's already done its job and it's corrected the blood glucose, which is now present. And also you really need, and also it's, 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 it's very highly variable uh, you know, by several fold and it doesn't give you the precision you need. Yeah, this is uh, actually, uh, this just came out in the last couple of months. There's, uh, you might have seen some news stories about it. In fact, we, we should probably post those. That's, it's still, uh, I would say, jury's still out on how safe or effective it is, but, but that's exactly right. There are ways of using uh, interstitial fluid and accessing it. Contact lens is one way, and actually, uh, we'll show you another interstitial fluid detector as well. So that's, a, that's a big opportunity um, that's just coming out. But still uh, unclear, really, how. Uh, and then, of course, you know, you need active finger stick requires you to be awake. Uh, you don't get it during. Uh... So what have people done? Well, uh, you basically you want to have a replacement pancreas. The pancreas is is what's doing the job. It, the beta cells are detecting sugar and then releasing insulin. You want to mimic really the beta cell. Um, well, uh, so if you could imagine what it would be, uh, it, it, would, it would be doing that role. Uh, you could imagine a pump, and indeed this, many people have these now, uh, pumps that uh, uh, have a direct delivery, direct access uh, through the skin uh, with, uh, for delivery of insulin. And there are different ways that it can have uh, glucose sensing that can be separate from the pump, uh, uh, and it extends the uh, glucose signal. Directly. Um, of course, here, you know, this is raising the other problem. You detect glucose, but then you've got to deliver insulin, and, and both of those involve uh, access. Um, now, a lot of people have the pumps. Uh, particularly young people are very resistant to this uh, as well. They really don't want to have pumps that uh, still challenge um, in, in medicine, even though the right device kind of exists, you have very poor acceptance by a, a very large. Uh... So what else could you do? Well, you know, we'd like to have things under the skin. You know, they, they just don't like being attached to this machine. It definitely could uh, put something under the skin. If you could maybe even a, a cellular artificial pancreas, that would be good. Or if you could somehow shrink everything down and, and put, make the whole thing less uh, obvious, that would also help. Um, so, you know, miniaturization is, is actually pretty useful. So uh, there are now sensors that, uh, including the contact lens strategy, but also little patches that you can put on the skin that don't directly measure the blood vessel glucose, but they measure the interstitial fluid glucose, which is the fluid sloshing around in between cells. It's not in cells, it's not in vessels, it's the third space, the interstitial fluid. And that tracks blood glucose pretty well, much closer than urine. And uh, by imposing little electric fields, you can help drive that uh, interstitial fluid uh, toward and, and away from your sensor. And you can uh, make measurements which are pretty accurate uh, without penetrating the skin. Um, and this is now, uh, you know, there are some drawbacks to how long the sensors last is an issue. Um, where the data goes, how it gets uh, processed is an issue. Now, we can actually, though, have this even on a, a wristwatch. There's a, a so Gluco watch is, uh, is available now. You can measure interstitial glucose. Still, of course, there's still the insulin delivery issue, but uh, 
well, you've got to still calibrate it with a finger stick, uh, but you get every 10 minutes you get a measurement. Um, again, there's some skin irritation. The sensor has a finite lifetime, has a two hour warm up period, but uh, it's worth it. So, this whole uh, interstitial system um, uh, basically uh, uh, drives uh, movement of this interstitial fluid using uh, very low uh, intensity electric fields. And uh, that is uh, you know, something that um, uh, solves the detection problem ultimately, but this biocompatibility uh, is, is probably a limiting issue. We see this in all kinds of tissue hardware interfaces. You know, mentioned with uh, deep brain stimulation, the uh, electrodes in the brain, they'll work for a while, they'll stop working after uh, a couple of years. Um, and what happens? Well, there's a tissue reaction. The tissue reacts, builds up, encases the uh, invasive element in the glia, and it stops working after a while. Similar principle everywhere, uh, and it's a common theme. We're always looking for ways to improve the uh, compatibility of our hardware with uh, third party. Um, it's kind of interesting, though, to think, uh, reflect on how far we've come. So the initial pump. Um, so little, little progress has been made. Um, and so then the question is, how could you truly make it closed loop and combine the monitoring with uh, delivery and put all that in some uh, unobtrusive situation? And uh, how do you make sure there's reliable communication between the sensor and the pump? Is it, you know, do you use radio frequency, which would go everywhere? The question is, would there be interference with other radio frequency? Okay, this, again, life and death thing. It's not like a little bit of, uh, you know, noise is tolerable in the system. You really have to make sure that you're getting the information exactly what you need and when. Or do you design it with an infrared system, kind of infrared beam, line of sight? That's good. It's less susceptible to interference. But then what if there's a disruption in that, uh, that line of sight communication? So uh, different strategies, a very active area for device-minded bioengineering. For cellular-minded folks, you know, there's the question is, well, let's, let's make new beta cells. Can we do that? That's really what we want. We want the cell knows how to do it. Let's, let's provide the cell in some way. Um, so you could imagine stem cell-based uh, production of beta cells. In theory, it looks pretty simple. With all the advances that have come in stem cells, you could even make the patient's own beta cells, in theory, from iPS cells. And we'll talk more about this in our, our stem cell lectures. But then there are, even if that were completely reliable, which it's not, uh, then there'd be the question of what, what do you do with those cells? Do, what do you inject them into the pancreas? What's the nature of their blood supply? That's, gonna, that's how they're going to detect the sugar, but also how they're going to deliver the insulin. If that's not exactly right, serious trouble. If they overgrow, undergrow, you're going to get impaired regulation. And again, you've got to be exactly right. There's no wiggle room here. Um, so maybe you could encapsulate them in some kind of membrane. At least you wouldn't have a cancer risk there. It's not like they would proliferate and, and cause uh, tumors. Uh, but then you, you know, you've exactly designing that becomes interesting. Um, protecting them from the immune system, but they still need access for, for nutrients and oxygen. And so they should have a, a, a permeable membrane of some sort. Uh, is it going to be biodegradable? Probably not, but it's got to be biocompatible to not cause a tissue reaction. And so there are a lot of interesting uh, sort of eyelet sheet technologies that are being a lot of engineering problems, not nearly uh, as simple as you'd like. And finally, there are, you know, you could imagine even non-beta cell related engineered therapies for, for diabetes. And here you might think about resistant form as an opportunity. It's much more common, not obviously treated by insulin because the body's got plenty of insulin. The problem is the tissue response. And there, you know, the, the goal is to reduce weight, you know, uh, reduce obesity, lifestyle modifications help, and but interventions to re reduce uh, body weight are clearly a strategy to go. And so the, here's an interesting strategy, the endo barrier, uh, still in, in development, but effectively, it's an endoscopically placed sleeve for your infection.
intestine gets anchored in there and that prevents absorption, basically coats intestine uh, in something that uh, acts as a physical barrier that digestive fluid travels through and uh, not get uh, absorbed. So that's interesting. It's been tested and actually approved in some cases. Um, trials ongoing in the U.S., but actually does cause uh, weight loss and, and uh, elevates uh, hormones that are involved in helping to regulate uh, better. Um, and diabetic patients, type 2, who, who uh, use this, they have glucose. And then this, hemoglobin A1C, this is a glycosylated hemoglobin. This is sort of a measure of the integral of elevated glucose over time. I mentioned this glycosylation that happens that causes disruption in uh, tissue. This is a lab test. It's a measurable that you can check every couple months and measures sort of the integrated level of protein glycosylation that's happened over that interval. Patients with the endobarrier have reduced uh, hemoglobin. So some uh, promise there as well, a neat sort of concept. Okay, so that's endocrine. We talked about what it is, where it is, interactions, uh, all the engineering applications and possibilities ranging from modeling uh, to detection, devices, medication, chemical engineering. Any questions? Endocrine, the whole thing? Yeah. How does the tissue lose its sensitivity to insulin? That is a kind of a million dollar question. If we knew that, we could probably design better therapies for uh, insulin resistant diabetes. Um, to my knowledge, it's simply not known. Um, if anybody else knows, uh, but it's, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a fundamental mystery. Why it relates to weight and exercise. Yeah, great question. For people who work non-typical schedules, uh, how does that affect their hormone uh, regulation and are there chronic or, or acute problems? So indeed, there is an acute disruption and that contributes to a lot of the problems people have with adjusting to, to circadian clock changes. Uh, in theory, uh, the body adjusts and indeed the circadian rhythm adjusts and the hormone regulation adjusts and uh, people can maintain a chronically uh, shifted, as long as it's a stably shifted circadian rhythm for a long period of time. Of course, the problem is people have weekends and so on, and, and they don't stay on that shifted uh, level no matter what. And so it, it actually, the long-term health consequences of, of uh, shift work are probably significant no matter what.